Hello, everybody. We had a few little technical difficulties there, and we're still kind of having some technical difficulties. So um, Gabe is one of the presenters, and we're going to share a screen just because we're having some uh, little bit of a technical difficulty. So if we're nothing if not adaptable. <laughs> that is one thing that we've all learned in this situation that you just have to adapt, whatever the circumstances are. So here we go. <laughs> Showing our adaptability in real time. Um, welcome to this session. Uh, this is Blockchain Paving the Way Out of the Pandemic. Um, I am Rosa Shores. I am the co-founder of Blockspaces. We are a blockchain uh, product development studio and solutions provider in Tampa, Florida, working out of Embark Collective. Um, and we are very much focused on um, building uh, enterprise grade blockchain applications and solutions and very much focused on mid-market these days for reasons that we're going to discuss. Um, we've seen some really amazing things happen uh, just over the last couple of months and um, we are very excited to kind of bring this presentation to you today and kind of wrap it all together for the audience. Um, I have an amazing panel, which are three of my favorite people in the world that I get the honor and pleasure to work with really every single day. Um, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves, um, starting with uh, Chris Tyler, and then we'll just kind of go in the in the uh, in the motion of this of the slide here, um, so you guys can know who you're talking to today. And so, Chris. Yep. Great. Glad to be here as always. Right. Um... Anyway, I, I'm about 30 years of software development uh, with some of the largest applications in the world. Um, last 15 years, I've been working with IBM, um, primarily around their analytics technology, and most recently focusing in on things like blockchain, IoT, and analytics, uh, AI, machine learning. Uh, I work with business partners, which is how I came to know Blockspaces and Gabe and Rosa and, and now Chuck. Um, and, and we're helping uh, to, to start to bring products, blockchain-based products to market. Um, some exciting stuff going on in the world of blockchain and, uh, you know, love to see IBM and Blockspaces at the forefront of that. So, Chuck? I'm Chuck Dyer. I started my career back in the late 80s in the uh, United States Marine Corps uh, doing satellite telecommunications and cryptology. Uh, I went from there into the private sector and worked with several banks doing ATM networks and integrations between banks during mergers and acquisitions. Uh, from then, I moved into working with emerging tech and cloud technologies, and I was part of a team that uh, built several global data centers around the world for a large company. And uh, the last six and a half years, I was with uh, Concerto Cloud Services, which was acquired by DXC Technologies. And I have been working with Blockspaces since September of last year, and it is a great team to work with, with some great technology. And I'm uh, Gabe Higgins. I'm a co-founder of Blockspaces, uh, early adopter of blockchain technology uh, in uh, 20, late 2012. Uh, started a series of meetups and groups uh, around the Bay Area uh, and organized those and organized uh, organize, uh couple different um, teams to develop applications and um, uh, do a lots of consulting. I've consulted with uh, uh, the Secret Service and other uh, companies and organizations uh, around the state of Florida uh, on the educating about blockchain technology. Awesome, guys. And like I said, they were just an amazing team. I'm super delighted to work with them every single day. I am Rosa Shores. I am also co-founder at Blockspaces um, and also vice president of the Florida Blockchain Business Association. We're focused on uh, lobbying for reasonable regulation um, around uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain. And Gabe's going to talk a little bit later about what's on the forefront of everybody's mind today, specifically in this space, as there are congressional hearings going on right now. Um, as far as uh, uh, talking about central bank digital currency and how it can be applied for pandemic payments. So it's, it's quite a surreal thing for all of us here that have been in this space for a long time to watch this kind of explode around us. So um, with that said, specifically this session, we're going to focus on um, what how blockchain has kind of adapted to and accelerated really um, with the pandemic and with COVID-19. Um, the congressional hearings today are just sort of like the, 
the tip of the iceberg of how this space has accelerated. And we'd already seen a lot of um, applications being developed and, you know, uh, blockchain has always been kind of a fast moving space. Um, you know, I, it's hard to pinpoint how much COVID-19 has accelerated adoption, but it doesn't bother me at all to say by at least five years. Um, these are existing problems that have been in place for a long time, um, but that COVID is really um, making people understand the pain points of some of our existing systems and some of the weaknesses in our existing systems, specifically around things like data transparency, provenance of items, and, um, and being able to access data in a way that you can be assured of the data integrity. Um, so many use cases emerging now about COVID, but they're, like I said, they are, they are pain points that have existed for a very long time. Um, I think that it's a good way to start to maybe talk about specifically some of these industries that we're seeing being disrupted. I think I'm gonna kind of turn it over to Chuck and you know, Chuck, with your background in enterprise and so some of the things that you're kind of seeing kind of bubble up. Um, what we have, you know, trade, healthcare, financial services, of course, is on everybody's mind because of today. But what are some of the other things that you're seeing that um, blockchain has really been able to be applied to now in, in regards to this pandemic? Yeah, that, that's that's a great, great segue there, Rosa. So the impact, obviously, COVID-19 has has caused disruption in many, many industries. Um, these three are, are major industries that have had disruption. Um, three specifically we'll talk about, you know, in trade, uh, certainly food supply. You know, over the last several months, I've been on calls with multiple state department of agriculture's talking about the, the problems in the ecosystem that they're seeing there. Um, you know, when this happened, this, this put a major, um, a major constraint within the ecosystem of food supply chain and farmers were finding it very difficult to be able to find ways to get their product to market because restaurants closed, hotels closed, you know, all these different avenues of which they were used to supplying their, their food through. Um, and whenever all these things shut down, they basically went into, they didn't have any way to find other distributing uh, lanes or other types of um, retailers to be able to take their product. So, you know, I've listened to so many heartfelt stories from different farmers in the farming agriculture community about having to put livestock down, having to destroy crops, having to um, basically dump tractor trailer loads full of milk products and all different types of things. Um, you know, and, and not having that robustness built into the ecosystem it has really kind of accelerated itself. And there's so many great solutions around blockchain, which we'll talk about later that impact that specific segment directly. In the healthcare space, yes. obviously having a pandemic, uh, we have a lot of changes that are going to have to happen in the healthcare community as it relates to being able to not only bring people back to work, uh, but actually provide safety for the employees and people who work within place that need to have consumers come back into it. So large venues, theme parks, uh, all these different types of, of venues where you have large organizations. So being able to have the ability to um, be tested to see if you had COVID-19 or when they have antibody tests or when they have vaccines to be able to validate that you have had those things in some way that can be easily consumed by either a store or uh, an employer in a way that you can come back to work safely so you're not risking yourself or other employees that may be in there. Um, and we'll talk about some solutions for that a little bit later. Again, with financial services, that's been the conversation of the day with the uh, congressional hearings. Um, and one of the things that kind of popped out to me was there are still over 35 million individuals who have not received their stimulus payments yet. Um, and that's because, you know, even though as much of the technology that we have going on today at our fingertips, there are still the unbanked population is still so underserved in the U.S. Uh, and not having solutions in place for digital currencies or ways to be able to get uh, currency out to those people who are underbanked or can't work with a bank because the banks were closed during this time. How do they gain access to money? Or even if they got a check, how are they even able to cash it if nothing's open? So lots of disruption in that place and uh, it's 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 been very eye-opening yeah yes and so that is that is a great point and we are also seeing some uh you know big players kind of step up and kind of bond together and join together um and uh you know there's this sort of focus now really on blockchain 
Um, and there was still, I think, confusion. You know, it's it's interesting. You know, we talk every day about blockchain, us here on the call, <laughs> us, the panel. <laughs> um, and but it, it and it kind of puts us in this bubble of you know that wow blockchain is accelerating so fast and you know we've you know all of these innovations and all of this stuff that is happening and it's really easy to kind of still be in this blockchain bubble so to speak where we you know this understanding of that there's still uh, many many probably the majority of people that don't really have an understanding of what blockchain is and so while we're seeing all of this stuff happen that feels almost like it's on light speed, um, you know, you, behind, outside of the doors of a blockchain company, there's still the, the vast majority of people who have confusion about what blockchain is or what it can do. So Gabe, do you wanna run us through a little bit about when we're talking about enterprise blockchain and this kind of spectrum of blockchains that are emerging, there's still like confusion about, you know, uh, is blockchain Bitcoin or cryptocurrency? You know, what is enterprise blockchain? We talk about that a lot at Block Spaces. So do you want to give kind of a high level of what we're talking about here when we're talking about enterprise blockchain? Sure. Yeah. So uh, what is blockchain, right? It's a basically a form of distributed ledger system where the data is stored and verified by users on a network. Now, this is um, the idea, the uh, impetus of this came from Bitcoin, but uh, now we're seeing applications where you can uh, disassociate the cryptocurrency from the underlying uh, blockchain and then deploy applications using that kind of ledger system, distributed ledger system, or, or distributed hash table where information is uh, kind of linked together in a series based on cryptographic hashes. So, um, and this means that information can't retroactively be changed or destroyed or corrupted um, in, in back in, backwards, back in the past. It's an upend only uh, kind of system. So you have a record of truth of what happened at any point in time in the past. And so now we're seeing where you can have these distributed ledger systems where you have uh, public chains, as they're called, uh, where where they're permissionless, meaning you don't need um, any kind of permissions to access that network. You can it's open, uh, it's distributed. Uh, all you have to do is basically download some software, install it on your computer, and you can access it. Or you don't even have to uh, download it on your computer. You can download an app on your mobile device and access that network. Or you know. Uh, interact with it in some way. Um, a permission chain is more of like a like a private insular uh, kind of uh, ecosystem where you have the same underlying technology, but uh, there's some kind of gatekeeper involved where um, only select groups of people or select uh, participants can actually uh, deploy information on that network. So this is the kind of range of where blockchain has has uh, come in the last 10 years. And so we're just seeing uh, just a variety of different use cases and applications that are leveraging these different types of systems for different reasons. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's really important because even we're gonna talk a little bit later, of course, about now what's happening you know, uh, you know, today uh, in regards to central bank digital currency, which is another thing, which is another thing almost entirely. So what started is sort of like this, um, this one use case that kind of launched it all. Um, we're seeing how this is now a spectrum. So I think that's important for the audience to understand that when we talk about blockchain, we're talking about a technology that's a foundational technology that can allow for all sorts of applications and use cases that we're just starting to understand and we're just starting to see, um, albeit at an extremely accelerated pace now. Um, in fact, what I, we were just listening to the congressional hearing and one of the congressmen, one of the congressmen from Georgia actually said, this is moving at light speed. This space is moving at light speed. So when congressional representatives are recognizing that, then you know it's really moving at light speed. So <laughs> not not just saying anything about congressional representatives, but so <laughs> so who are some of these early? <laughs> I had to throw that in there. You guys know I did. So um, so what are some of the things we're seeing now? Now we talk about these kind of uh, 
uh, use cases um, other than cryptocurrency. Um, and I think that it's important to understand that there's some really big, some of the top businesses in the world, some of the top enterprises in the world, the very active uh, production ready, production in production uh, blockchain systems. Chris, I'm gonna kind of throw it to you because IBM um, is for sure not the only person in this space, but they are absolutely the leader in enterprise blockchain, I would say. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing, um, uh, uh, at IBM spe specifically around, you know, food and, um, some of those things that you're seeing? Yeah. And, you know, I'll, I'll kind of echo what Rosa was saying is, you know, when I first started getting into blockchain, just, you know, and I'm, I'm a relative newbie compared to these guys. Right. Um, you know, it, it, it was primarily cryptocurrency and maybe a little bit of supply chain talk, right? Um, and we're starting to see a ton of new use cases coming out. And, and probably one of the, the premier sort of enterprise blockchain stories is around, you know, what, we, what IBM worked on with Walmart and uh, is around food supply chain. Uh, and and it's primarily it started around food safety. So the head of food safety at Walmart came to his team and said, Hey, I, I, I've got this box of mangoes. Tell me where it came from. And, and about seven days later, they came back and said, this is where it originated from. And, and basically what that highlighted was that if you were going to recall anything, you know, it, they didn't have time to, to waste. They just would pull everything off the shelf and figure it out later. And that was very costly. It was not costly not only from time and money, but also from reputation and so forth. Right. So, so that wasn't acceptable. And what they did was they implemented a blockchain that could track and trace uh, perishable goods or, or um, fresh food all the way from the the farm to the fork. Right. And that's where the term "farm to fork" comes from. Uh, food to table, so forth. Where. Um, you, you basically have this visibility to everything that's happened in between. And they could now track and trace any of these perishable goods in less than 2.2 seconds. So instead of having to go into 50 different systems, they could see, have line of sight all the way from where things were on the shelf back to the, the farm where it came from. Right? And since then, this has been adopted for other things, things like food freshness and f reducing food waste, uh, being able to prove provenance of food so I can know that if I'm buying something that's organic, uh, that it is truly organic. And, and I think Chuck alluded to this earlier as well, right, is now you start to have this network of people within the food supply chain, right? And now you start to create marketplaces where uh, people that have product can get that to market and, and people who want to buy things can have visibility to what's there and have that tr immediate trust because they have transparency to what's, uh, what's happened with that food from beginning to end. Okay. So ne next slide, Rosa. And, Along that same concept of supply chain, right, but a completely different industry. And this is something that came out of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was, and like Rosa said, this has been a problem all along that just never really surfaced itself until now was, you know, you think about the uh, PPE, the, the personal uh, protective equipment and even things like uh, ventilators that were in short demand or, sh or short supply, I should say, um, because there just wasn't enough suppliers to, to meet the needs. Um, we, we started to run out of these things. We started to have a shortage of these things. And people stepped up. You had auto manufacturers coming up and saying, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll build ventilators. And you had clothing manufacturers that would start to make PPE equipment, right? And, and they had the, the, they were building the supply, but they had no way to get it to market. Auto manufacturers don't sell to hospitals, right? You know, or at least not ventilator equipment. And ma clothing manufacturers don't sell to he healthcare workers. That's just not their traditional market. They have no trust uh, as, as suppliers into that supply chain. And the buyers have no visibility to them because they don't know who they are. Right? And that was a problem. And IBM 
joined a consortium of uh, organizations and built something called Rapid Supplier Connect. Built this very quickly, and they built it on some some existing technology, some existing blockchain technology they had, but started to build this trusted consortium and this trusted network, where if I was one of these suppliers and, and I I had some trusted credentials. I could bring those trusted credentials and my available supply to Rapid Sup Supplier Connect. If I was a buyer and I had some need, right, I could post that need into this marketplace and they would marry up um, these, these organizations. And, and it's all tracked on blockchain. You've got the trust because you have the trusted credentials. You have the knowledge of the demand. And, and so you could start to reduce things like wasted uh, product, right? Stuff that's sitting there on the shelf unused. We could uh, get things into the hands of people who needed it much more quickly. And these are some of the things that blockchain can start to help with. And I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything, or, um, but that's, you know, just another use case that blockchain can help uh, with and has been helping with. Yeah, t totally. And, and I think, again, that it just kind of it's interesting because it's like, oh, look, all of these things are happening because of COVID. And, you know, <laughs> we can do these blockchain applications that, you know, can potentially solve these things because of COVID. But it's not, these aren't problems that COVID created. These are problems that COVID exasperated. <laughs> and so these are things that, that existed. These are weaknesses in our systems in our, in our supply chains, in our processes, in our being able to track tests, COVID-19 tests, our disease surveillance, our digital identification, our credentialing, our, these aren't things that COVID created. These are things that COVID exposed. And so th there's, this, there's this mind shift that we can't go back to the way that it was. We have to go back to better than it was. We have to go back with improved systems. And so we're creating more resilient systems where this doesn't happen again, because it will happen again whether it's with a virus or another kind of disaster or, or, you know, a massive hack, whatever it is, these are weaknesses in our existing systems that need to be improved. And you know, we believe blockchain is that technology that will do that. Healthcare compliance. This is a massive one that's very relevant to what's going on with COVID. Um, Chuck, I, you, do you want to maybe take this one and walk us through a little bit of what's happening with the pharmaceutical industry and some of the things that we're seeing, not just tracking pharmaceuticals, but some of the healthcare uh, applications that are, are, or issues that we're seeing right now that uh, blockchain can be a solution for, that we are seeing blockchain become a solution for. Right, absolutely. Um, so obviously this one's around the FDA, so just a quick bit of background on this one specifically. So the Drug Quality and Security Act uh, was enacted by Congress back in 2013. And there's a part of that act, which is Title II, which is the Drug Supply Chain Security Act. Um, and that specific title outlines steps to be able to build a system to identify and trace prescription medication as they're distributed throughout the United States. So they're trying to, to basically better uh, have better visibility into the supply chain and try and root out any type of fraud uh, or drugs that are coming into the supply chain that are not U.S. based that may come from um, foreign countries that may not be uh, approved by the FDA or whatever. So in February of 2019, the FDA announced the creation of this pilot project program and MediLedger was chosen as the blockchain company to participate in that project. Um, their final report was uh, finally released this year uh, and it detailed very explicitly the viability of what blockchain can do to support track and trace the requirements of this uh, Drug Supply Chain Security Act. Um, but obviously they I also uncovered a lot of hurdles that existed with that with that specifically, um, all participants in the supply chain have to participate in order for this to work. So that exposes a lot of mid-market level companies that don't have the, you know, don't know how to use blockchain. They don't have the resources, they don't have the skills, they don't understand it. So in order for them to have to be able to participate in this network, you know, they have to have people be able to help them from that perspective. They also are going to need some sort of governance layer, whether that's the industry does that self through self-management or the FDA does that. There's still not any agreement in how that would really happen. And then there also has to be agreement on data standards across the ecosystems because every single one of these companies within um, the ecosystem has different systems that they use for those things. And that data 
and the standards of that data have to be able to be used in that ecosystem across the blockchain. So the standardization of that. Um, and, and again, like I said, you have a lot of mid-market players in the ecosystem, especially in the, you know, the prescription medication, you know, from distribution to delivery to all these different types of things that have different disparate systems that have to be able to connect into whatever this system is going to end up being and be able to be interoperable in that. So that's a solution that Blockspaces is specifically addressing in the market, not just within healthcare, but within all different types of blockchain networks, um, both public and private, and how do we help mid-markets be able to onboard into those things? Yep. So, uh, so yes, I absolutely, totally agree. And with that, I think we're gonna segue into something that is probably on everybody's mind that's watching this. And if you're, if it's not on your mind, um, I suggest you tune in. I think it's still going on live right now because history is absolutely being, oh, I'm sorry, it's not. <laughs> Gabe's been watching it since noon. So um, let's talk about central bank digital currency. This is in a sea of unreal things that make me feel completely surreal from 2020, which I get where to even start. But the fact that, there's a congressional hearing about distributing pandemic funds, listening to some of these congressional representatives talk about central bank digital currency. I can't, as someone who has been in this space since 2013 ish, uh, it's so surreal to me that I can't describe it. Um, very, very important piece of history happening right now. If you're not, if you haven't tuned in, go back and like watch it. It's kind of incredible. I'm um, gonna have Gabe talk about it because he, he is the guy to talk about it. He's been watching it since noon. So what's going on with this? And tell us how central bank digital currency, I know you did a, a newscast um, at Bay News 9 on Libra, which is another sort of uh, got the feds kind of riled up. Um, what's going on with all of this central bank digital currency? What does that even mean? Yeah, well, basically um, it has to do with tokenizing or digitizing uh, the US dollar. Uh, and now there's uh, initiatives, uh, one called the Digital Dollar Project, actually, that's being headed by the recently former uh, chair of the CFTC, who is spearheading this campaign to uh, bring about a uh, distributed digital dollar. Um, and this would be blockchain based. And so he was on this hearing that just happened, just uh, at, was said at noon. Um, so having congressional hearings about it, you know, it's pretty serious. Um, of course, this happened uh, last year, mid last year with uh, Facebook announcing that they're coming out with their own digital currency that will be recognized globally and with um, two dozen other uh, partners, huge partners, um, all private companies, uh, some nonprofits, but um, no banks were involved with that one. Um, but the conversation has definitely not escaped the banking industry. Um, this has been a topic of conversation now for the last couple of years. It's only recently uh, within the past, I would say six months, where the, the elevation of the conversation has really taken a serious tone. And even uh, to where you have countries uh, deploying uh, pilot, pilots that are um, actually deploying these central banked digital currencies. So we're seeing a huge shift very quickly um, where this technology was largely dismissed, but now it's being adopted by countries and financial institutions across the world. Um, as you can see here, um, this is uh, the Bank for International Settlements, which is, which is a consortium of 62 of the world's central banks. And they're talking about instituting their own uh, central bank digital currency, creating standards around what that would uh, look like. And they're creating, uh, they're, they're one of the uh, participants in creating the first drafts that included a digital dollar in the, in the first stimulus package that was, uh, was just uh, released with Congress uh, this past go around. They didn't in, uh, end up including it in the final draft, but the fact that it was drafted at all uh, means that that kind of legislation is already kind of sitting in Congress and can be pulled into any other bill, any other stimulus package bill. And that's what the conversation was about today. It revolved around 
how do we uh, better serve uh, the American people and and with all the people, like Chuck mentioned earlier, with all the people that are unbanked still in the United States, it's kind of uh, unnerving that, that there's so many people that have no access to uh, basic financial services that most of us just completely take for granted. Um, and I, the idea of digitizing these dollars would mean that uh, people can have greater access to those financial services yeah. and you can employ um, cheaper and faster uh, financial services as well. Yeah. So this is this conversation has elevated uh, very quickly. We are um, talking to a couple uh, different banks that are also taking this seriously now as they're hearing it coming down the pike um, that this this is this is inevitable. Uh, we're seeing huge uh, markets and in countries like China, um, taking this very seriously. They've already started uh, deploying their pilot program and testing it with banking partners in within their country. Um, of course, I, I would hope that America would uh, follow more along the lines of um, what we're used to having as far as uh, abiding by our privacy rights as we have as, as Americans. Uh, unfortunately, the Chinese people will likely not have that option with their digital uh, currency, but um, that's what the topic of conversation is about. Yeah, and each one of these slides we could probably do, and we probably have <laughs> done a presentation on at some point over the last three years. So if any of these topics are of interest to you further, or you wanna talk about it further, or if you have any other questions, please make sure and, and hit us up, send any of us emails, I'll give those emails at the end. Um, we want to kind of move on because block spaces has certainly um, been heads down since everything happened with COVID. Um, we have been um, kind of fielding a lot of incoming um, from enterprise, um, specifically at that mid-market level, but also interest in uh, front-facing user applications for, um, for blockchain. So we have been in development um, and um, have some uh, prototypes that we have been working on, not just for blockchain applications, but for also something that's kind of near and dear to all of our hearts and always has been, which is multi-blockchain integration. Um, so we'll kind of wrap that all up here in the next few slides, because I know we're kind of kicking down to the last 10 minutes. Uh, Chris, do you want to walk us through um, really quickly our Demeter platform that we have um, that we have been developing, and then we'll kind of loop it all together uh, with Harmonia. Yeah, and like, like I touched on earlier, you know, there, there have been a lot of challenges around food supply chain that are being addressed by uh, blockchain technology. And, um, we, uh, Blockspaces has taken a, a view of that um, in light of a lot of the things that were brought to light because of COVID-19, but they, they've been there all along is this lack of ability to get fresh product uh, that that has been harvested, that's been manufactured, or it's been produced out to people that want to buy that, right? Um, and, and so that idea of getting farm fresh farm food out to consumers that may want to buy that, a lot of consumers, whether they're consumers like myself or they could be local restaurateurs or local hoteliers that want to buy fresh local produce. A lot of times they have no idea where to go get that, right? So Demeter is designed to help get that fresh produce or that fresh uh, seafood or whatever it happens to be into the hands of people that want to buy that, right? And, and also streamline some of the processes along the way for tracking and tracing and making visible uh, the provenance of that, uh, that product, right? So that people who haven't bought from them can, can immediately have trust in that product, right? Um, tracking things like, yes, if they say they are USD organic, we can actually prove that they meet the criteria set forth by the USDA. Um, and, and then also allow for things like digital commerce, right? So that if I'm a, a consumer want to buy from that farmer, then I can facilitate that commerce, right? So yeah. um, there's a lot more there, but we, 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 we're going to move on. So. Yep. yep. Um, another product that we have um, been uh, actively developing. Um, and again, all of these products are front facing consumer applications that are built on top of a, 
of a, a more robust multi-blockchain integration platform that we will be talking about here in a minute. So, um, which I want to definitely spend at least the last couple of minutes on. So Chuck, do you want to quickly want to sue HealthClear on some of the things that we have in the works with HealthClear? <clears throat> Absolutely. So we, we all know that in uh, any type of organization, your HR department is primarily responsibility for uh, when you onboard new employees, as far as them meeting certain health and wellness requirements in order to be able to take a job for lifting things or being on your feet, whatever it may be. One of the things that COVID-19 has really exposed is the ability to uh, work in a safe environment. So there have been a lot of discussion around um, the COVID-19, the virus, making sure that, you know, if you have symptoms for it or you have it and you want to be able to return to work, there has to be some type of a process in place to where the HR departments can validate that those employees are returning back and they're not, they don't have that COVID anymore, or if they have the antibodies or if a virus or if a, uh, um, if, if a uh, vaccine comes out, that they, they would be treated for that vaccine. What HealthClear does is it provides the ability for um, uh, an employer to uh, have their employee go to a clinic or their doctor or whatever it may be, be tested for the virus, make sure they don't have it, it would be stored in a digital certificate and sent back to the HR department. But the nice thing about this is this can be used for any type of medical clearance coming back, not just COVID-19. So if you're a company that does construction work and you have somebody break their leg, they wanna come back to work, you can get a health clearance from them through this system um, to be able to make sure they can come back or with whatever restrictions. This also puts the uh, onus for the HIPAA part of that data in the consumer's hand or the employee's hand to be able to only share that data with the employer that is viable to them and that the employer is not you know, held in any type of um, legal uh, issuance because of the, the sharing of specific types of data because the, the individual is the actual owner of that data. Um, so that's, that's really what this product is, is focused on. Yep, very good. And just quickly, and and, and I, I had hoped to be able to spend a little more time on this last slide, but um, I think I'm going to kind of throw it back to Chris, because as we're talking about these different applications, whether it's Demeter or IBM Food Trust or, um, you know, the Rapid Supplier Connect or, or all of these other blockchains, I mean, what we have seen emerge over the last, you know, a decade um, is that is that this is there is no one blockchain to solve all of these applications are built on different blockchains are using different protocols they're different parts of different networks and so this whole concept of that we are moving toward a multi blockchain world I mean I think that's almost a, a a assumed given in the blockchain space now that there is no one blockchain to end all be all. Um, and that there's going to be different parts of, um, of uh, even within one company solutions that need that require multiple blockchains, and they're going to need them to be able to integrate with each other as well as integrate with legacy systems. Um, yeah. So, Chris, you want to walk us through uh, the, the the thing that actually supports all of these other projects that we're doing, which is the core platform of Harmonia. Yeah, and you know, there's not only different blockchain technologies you know you've heard us mention a few between cryptocurrency public private permission permissionless and so forth right all these different technologies that are under the covers but then the applications or the networks that are built on top of them right so uh, you know there, there's within the food supply chain i think there's probably four or five maybe six different leading uh food track and trace blockchain networks, right? You have, there's 5,000 or so different cryptocurrencies out there, right? So, you know, it, it is already a multi-chain world. People just may not be interacting with multiple chains. Uh, and so we firmly believe that, you know, between the different technologies, the different protocols that are needed to interact with these different chains, there needs to be some e simplification of, of leveraging these uh, this blockchain technology. It's it's going to happen where you know most businesses are going to, in some form or fashion, interact with a blockchain network at some point. Whether that's accepting cryptocurrency or or digital currency as a a, a payment method, or whether that's tracking and tracing their supply chain uh, products so forth right it, it, at some point you're going to have to interact with the blockchain it's and, and 
you're going to eventually have to interact with multiple. So Harmonia is designed to streamline it, the onboarding uh, of into those networks and streamline the integration between your ERP, CRM, HR systems into these blockchain networks, right? Which is going to be a requirement whether you've gotten there or not, it's going to happen. And we want to make that as easy as possible. Something as easily as going into a work work uh, or into a marketplace and saying, I have this particular HR system. Maybe I have a work day or maybe I have an SAP or something. And I have uh, something else for my CRM. I have something else for my ERP. And I need those to integrate with this blockchain network and that blockchain network and be able to pick from those, pull those together and then be able to integrate that very rapidly. And, and because we are building multiple customer facing or uh, organization facing applications, as well as helping to build these blockchain networks, we're able to put those, those building blocks together very quickly. Yep. Well, awesome. And we are, we, like I said, we could spend, we could spend a whole entire presentation on every single one of these individual slides that we did. And it, I think at some point over the past, uh, since Black Spaces has been alive or even before that, um, we have done presentations on all of these. So if you have any interest, any further interest in any one slide or going over what you saw or just want to contact us in general, um, you can reach out to any of us. We're at blackspaces.io or you can reach out to us individually on email um, or hit us up on LinkedIn and we'd love to answer any of your questions. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for doing this. That was a lot of phenomenal information. And to all the attendees, you can actually find them on my community section as well to uh, link up with them. And at the end of the session, on the upper right-hand corner, when you X out, it'll be able to bring you back to the agenda page. Uh, starting here in just about 15 minutes, we have disaster recovery solutions presented by Amazon Web Services. Uh, policy updates post COVID-19, a conversation with state and federal elected officials. And in that we actually have a member of the Florida state, um, let's see actually, cause I've already forgotten, uh, Florida state Senate and a US Congressman, uh, part of the house of representatives. And concurrently, we also have your entrepreneur, entrepreneurial toolkit starting and scaling in the new reality. So I hope to see you guys there. Thanks. Thank you.